Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Aurora Energy Research Program today. So I'm the Event Officer for Energy Society. I'm Alan, and today let me welcome um, the team from Aurora, and they will introduce you to the recent works of Aurora and also the graduate program. Let me extend my warm welcome to Victor from Aurora and the team, as well as a warm welcome to everyone that are watching today. So over to you, Victor. All right, hello everyone and uh, welcome to this event. We are very glad to be here. We have um, put a lot of work into putting this event together, uh, obviously with a lot of help from the Ulster Energy Society, uh, to whom we are very glad to be sponsoring for a second year in a row. This is our second year as, a, as an official sponsor for the Ulster Energy Society. We believe that there is a great pool of talent within the society. And um, aside from that, there is a lot of value that we can mutually offer each other um, throughout the year. We had a good experience um, sponsoring uh, the society uh, last year. Um, hence, we decided to do this again this year. And this is the first event that we're holding um, as part of the um, as part of the program. We're going to be covering a few topics, um, mainly focused on, first of all, what is it that we do as Aurora Energy Research? Uh, for those of uh, you who don't know us, we are a consulting company uh, based in the heart of Oxford. For those of you who um, are already here around the city and have gotten to know a little um, about Oxford, we're uh, fairly close to, to the Westgate fairly close to um, to Pure Gym, uh, to make it a bit more uh, specific. At the same time, we're not necessarily uh, completely going to the office for reasons that we can all understand at the moment, um, but that's where our offices are based. Um, and uh, we're really glad to be here talking to you today. Um, as we mentioned, we're gonna be covering a few different topics, but before we go into the topics, let's go into the people who will be sharing uh, some thoughts and, thoughts and experiences with you. First of all, uh, we have Steph Stephanie Onsworth. Stephanie is part of the um, part of the CP team at the moment. She has some good experiences, and she's one of our uh, recent joiners. So uh, she has some good experiences uh, and thoughts that she would like to share with you, as well as uh, Emma Woodward. Uh, she's also a recent joiner, but uh, unlike Stephanie, Emma has quite a lot of experience in the energy sector, much more than me or Stephanie, or both of us combined. So uh, also nice to get a senior perspective into the picture. Myself, Victor Martinez, I've been in Aurora for around, uh, well, a bit over a year now. And John Long, who has a very unique perspective of the company working in one of the main, most exciting companies, uh, most exciting areas in the company, which is software as a service, as you uh, may have heard the, the, the slang before, SaaS, basically. So I will open the floor now so that um, each one of, uh, of them can go through a brief introduction of themselves. Uh, should we start with um, Emma? I see you're not muted, so uh, should we start with Emma? Uh, yeah, thanks, Victor. Um, so I'm Emma Woodward. Um, I'm a senior associate on the commission projects team at Aurora. Um, I've been with the company for about a month now, um, having a great time so far. Um, before then, I've spent about six and a half years working uh, in the African energy sector. Um, so mainly looking at oil and gas projects um, across the continent. Yeah, I'll, uh, I'll hand over to Stephanie. Um, hi guys, so I'm part of the graduate programme and I started about three and a half months ago now. Everyone has been super lovely, it's been really nice joining and getting up to speed and learning a lot of new things. So I'll now pass over to John. Uh, thank you. So I'm John Long, a project analyst um, at Aurora. Uh, I generally have been working on, um, on cloud-based tools, which we developed, specifically Amun, which you might hear a little bit more about uh, later in this presentation. Um, but in general, um, my role sits somewhere between a data scientist and a consultant. All right, I think that was a, a good uh, round of introductions. So uh, these are the people that are gonna be sharing with you today. Um, one of the main important things that, we, uh, that we'd like to point out is that, as you can see, we are all people from inside the company. So you're getting a first-hand experience uh, with people who work um, in the company, uh, people who can offer uh, very good experience and can answer your questions, specifically about the nature of the work. Because one of the main things that we'd like to do today is showcase uh, the things that we do uh, in Aurora as a consultancy and um, showcase the opportunities that we might have and uh, specifically, like we mentioned in the beginning, the Oxford Energy Society is a great pool of talent 
uh, coming from, uh, well, uh, officially the best university in the world. So we are very interested into uh, showcasing everything we have and uh, hopefully, if you find that interesting, um, get you to apply to one of the programs or recruitment opportunities that we have within the company. And that brings me to the topics that we'll be covering today. First of all, uh, we'd like to um, give a brief introduction to a wider sense of saying why work in the energy sector. Um, I can think of many reasons, um, but I will let Emma uh, walk us through that. Basically, we want to uh, tell you that the in, in the industry in which we are, the challenges that we're facing as an industry, as in broader society, and how um, how we hope to be helping quite a lot into bringing that sustainability and bridging the gap between sustainability and the business as usual that we have today and decarbonization and tackling, uh, tackling climate change. So um, I cannot see Emma at the moment, but Emma, if you're around, uh, would you care to take us through the first section on why work in the energy sector? All right, it seems like we might have lost Emma. Um, and we have Emma back. <laughs> oh, perfect. I was just panicking. My internet dropped out just then. Um, so apologies for that. Uh, hopefully it won't uh, happen again uh, for the next five or 10 minutes um, as I'm talking. Um, yeah, so, but anyway, thank you very much for that introduction, Victor. Um, okay, so why work in the energy sector? Uh, so, According to the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, or the IPCC, um, by around 2030 to 2040, average global temperatures are expected to increase uh, by about 1.5 degrees Celsius uh, compared to average global temperatures in 1850. Now, whilst any increase in global temperature could be considered risky, uh, 1.5 degrees is really considered quite a dangerous threshold. Um, and above this, any impacts uh, of the temperature increase is likely to have pretty disastrous consequences for the planet. Um, obviously, this is caused by uh, increasing carbon dioxide, uh, as well as other greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, uh, which are there as a result of anthropogenic activity. Uh, so the graph that we're looking at demonstrates average observed temperature increases um, from 1960 to date, uh, and also models of what temperatures might look like if we manage to bring carbon dioxide emissions under control, uh, so to net zero um, by 2050. Um, which is a goal we're going to discuss a little bit further um, in a couple of slides time. Um, so this models it under several different scenarios um, and we can see sort of an average uh, or we can see a maximum uh, a minimum potential temperature change uh, as a result of, of reaching net zero um, by 2050 or 2055 I think. Um, so the main point that I want to make here is that even uh, as you, can, as you can see, even if we do reach net zero, it isn't actually guaranteed that we're going to limit global warming to that 1.5 uh, degree temperature increase. There's a good chance, uh, even under a net zero scenario, um, that we're going to cross that threshold. So why are we talking about this? Um, if we move on to the next slide, uh, we can see that 73% of global emissions are caused by the energy in industry. Um, largely as a result of industrial processes, um, through heating and electricity use, uh, which includes aircon in buildings, um, and also through the combustion of fossil fuels in transport, um, as well as from other sectors which have a lesser impact. Now, every single one of these sectors um, contributes, as we said, a large amount to carbon dioxide emissions globally. And every single one of these sectors is really going to have to change the way they do things uh, if we're going to meet our climate goals. So. Uh, if we go on to the next slide, um, the IPCC recommends that we reach net zero emissions by 2050. Um, this graph shows uh, how global emissions have changed from 1970 to date uh, and what future emissions paths are going to have to look like uh, if this goal is met. Uh, and this graph really should give you a sense of the scale of change that we're going to need um, and how challenging it's actually going to be. So how are we going to achieve this? Um, on the next slide, it shows uh, some, but not all, uh, of the changes that we're going to have to make um, under a net zero scenario, and, and huge progress is going to be needed right across the energy sector. Uh, the first challenge uh, is going to be related to energy efficiency. Um, primary energy demand growth is going to have to slow to about 1.7% uh, per year, which is a 30% reduction compared to the last 30 years and a 50% reduction compared to the last 50 years. 
Now, in some countries, uh, particularly in Western Europe, including the UK, we have made quite a bit of progress here. Um, but part of the reason for this is because we've exported a good proportion uh, of our carbon dioxide emissions uh, to, the, to the rest of the world, to the Far East, um, as a result of uh, exporting a lot of our industry and manufacturing processes. Um, there's also still millions of people right across the planet, uh, particularly in Africa, who don't have access to energy networks at all. Um, and so in areas like this, demand is still going to have to increase. Um, so whilst in some respects energy efficiency is maybe the easiest of these goals to meet, uh, we've still got an awful lot of work to do um, if we're going to bring primary energy demand growth under control. Um, the next goal, um, and possibly the second easiest, uh, as I see it, uh, is increasing the use of renewable energy in the energy uh, in the energy system, um, which is obviously is going to result in an increase in the utilisation uh, of wind and solar technologies. Uh, now, we've also done a pretty good job of this historically. Um, we're constantly learning uh, and new market designs are being implemented in many countries across the globe uh, in order um, to, to integrate renewables into our energy systems. But alongside this, we're definitely going to also need to see an increase in investment in storage technologies, uh, such as batteries, um, because obviously a, a renewable generation is pretty intermittent. Um, and we're in the future, we're going to need to store energy uh, that's generated uh, at times of high renewable generation um, for use uh, when less energy is being generated through clean sources. Alongside this, grid infrastructure is definitely also going to be need to be improved uh, in order to accommodate a lot of these new technologies. Um, a lot of people tout carbon capture and storage um, as a solution to increasing carbon dioxide emissions. Um, and it's expected that by 2050, some, 12, some 10 to 12 tonnes of carbon dioxide is going to be sequestered uh, every year. Um, capture costs are falling, um, but even so, um, by 2050, about 0.3 to $1 trillion per year uh, are going to have to be spent on um, ECS. And it's sometimes questionable as, as whether that carbon will definitely stay underground uh, once we've gone to the there. Uh, so moving on to some of the biggest challenges now, uh, fuel switching um, to electricity. Uh, it's estimated that by 2050, uh, some 80% of fuels used in transport, in heat, in heat uh, and in industry are going to have to be converted to electricity. So that's converting the gas boilers in, to, in our house um, to electric heating systems. Um, it's using electric vehicles instead of uh, combustion fuels uh, in our cars. Um, uh, which has got a total uh, unknown total cost at the moment. Uh, some aspects of industry will also not switch that easily. Um, and so investment in new fuels such as hydrogen uh, are also going to be needed to meet demand here. That's particularly related to industrial processes um, which need very high temperature heat um, to work. We're also going to have to see an uh, a divestment uh, of fossil fuels, um, potentially being ridden down to the tune of 1 million US dollars uh, by 2050, uh, with no new exploration after 2030. Uh, now I've come from a fossil fuel environment before I joined Aurora, and this is a bigger challenge uh, than it sounds. Um, there's a lot of countries who have barely tapped uh, the resources that they have underground and are pretty keen not to miss out um, on the potential income that they could bring. Um, so it's gonna need some fairly major policy changes right across the world uh, if we're gonna meet um, this criteria. So to answer the initial question, why should you want to work in the industry? Now, energy really does form the backbone of everything that we do and the decarbonisation of the industry is the biggest challenge it can possibly face. Um, but really, I mean, it's, it's fun. It's, it's a great challenge to have. Um, and I don't see any industry that you could come into uh, where you'll have a bigger impact uh, on the planet as a whole um, over the course of our careers. So definitely get involved. Uh, I'll hand back over to Victor, uh, who's got two more sections of the presentation to go through. All right, that was that was absolutely perfect, Emma. Thank you so very much. Um, as everyone can see, uh, I'll leave that, this slide on the screen for a while just so that we can get a tiny bit of a taste of how big a challenge the energy transition really is. And when I say a tiny taste, it's also because we need to take into account this. This is not only happening on a technological level. It's not only happening on a market level. It's also happening on a society level. We're talking about people's behavioral changes. We're talking about divesting from probably the biggest industry that there is in the world at the moment, which is the fossil, uh, or one of the biggest industries, which is fossil fuels. Um, we're talking to a complete makeover 
um, of our energy systems and usage. If we think about it, there is um, one, there is one specific quote from uh, Peter Fox Penner, a very good book called Smart Power. I would recommend it to anyone uh, studying right now in the energy uh, in the energy field. I would recommend them to read it. And he says that we basically need um, to redo our whole, um, as an analogy, say uh, our whole um, airports, our whole communication systems, our whole airplanes. So imagine redoing the whole aviation system and market while the planes are still in the air and full of passengers. And that is a good analogy because this whole transformation still needs to happen while people need to meet uh, their energy needs, while countries still, in, in a large extent, can depend on the income uh, from uh, from energy and even fossil fuels. Um, and this needs to happen on a societal level, market and technology. So it is very, um, and um, it's very, very interesting. Another thing that I would like to point out is that um, we are on a joint platform at the moment. So we, uh, if you're watching us on Facebook Live or if you're watching us on YouTube, uh, you can uh, post the questions on uh, on the comment section. We'll receive them and uh, we'll take them. Uh, we'll take them as as we go. We're also going to have a Q and A uh, session at the end. So uh, if your uh, uh, question is not answered right away, uh, don't worry because we can uh, take time at the end and answer any questions that, that you guys might have. So thank you very much again, Emma, uh, for your contribution. I hope that really paints a picture into um, that really paints a picture into the challenge that we have at hand. And then the second question is, well, you already decided that you want to work in the energy industry, or hopefully let's say that you did. You decided that you want to work in the energy industry. You decided that the impact that you want to have um, in the world, in the in the environment, is worth the effort. It's worth uh, it's worth putting that inspiration to the sector. So then, if you're going to work into the sector, why would you uh, join Aurora? What does Aurora bring into this grand energy transition? What does it bring uh, to my professional development, to my experience? What things can I uh, can I get to work on? Well, and that's what we're going to explore in this second section. So I'll walk us through this second section and. Um, uh, with the uh, starting first with the fact as to what is it that we do, and what we say uh, when we describe what we do, we say that we um, bring independent intelligence for the global energy energy transition, and this is very important because we have, like we said, a lot of investments going into renewable energy efficiency, district heating, you name it. At the same time, we have divestment, um, like Emma just uh, painted us the picture from fossil fuels. We have governments putting in incentives or subsidies or any kind of uh, regulatory scheme to support the, de um, the deployment of renewables uh, and other and, and efficiency measures and so on. So there is a lot here going on. And the question is, how can we get to where we want to get? How we, can we get to net zero or tackling climate change in the best way possible? And in order to determine that, we need uh, actual, tangible, independent intelligence. And that is what we in Aurora uh, try to provide. So uh, if you want to look at it, first of all, we develop insights. So um, we do research developments in the energy sector, in markets, technology, and policy. So we don't stay in any of these three sectors. We try to look at a wider range um, to have a holistic picture of the energy sector. We build economic models of the energy markets, for example, electricity, natural gas, or hydrogen. This is particularly interesting um, because market, we model these markets. We model these markets in an economic level. Um, there is a lot of work that goes into this. We, uh, we'll see that in a bit uh, in the following slide that John is going to talk to us about. But there's a lot of work that goes into modeling these markets to, uh, to provide forecasts and intelligence of things, like we said, power, natural gas, and, and even hydrogen, which is a very uh, cool addition that we have that we'll walk you guys through. Uh, we'll have a good case study on that. And we forecast the, the future of the energy system. We, we model these markets so that we know what's going to happen with these markets uh, 30 years down the road. What is going to be the price of power in 2050? If we go with if we go with complete renewables and we forget about natural gas or CCS, what's the impact on the, on, on the power price and that, uh, that sort of insight? We develop this so that we can better inform the decisions. And at the same time, we also solve our clients' problems. Clients come to us with problems and then um, we develop reports or insights specifically addressed to answer those questions and those insights. We provide market advisory for transactions. Someone's trying to sell an asset, someone's trying to buy an asset, or uh, or maybe do an investment in the energy sector, we provide that support. 
So on the modeling side, we already knew that we model these markets. That's very interesting. We also um, we also support multi million dollar transactions, uh, which is also something very interesting um, to be involved in in the energy sector. And we advise companies on strategy and operations. So we also advise on a qualitative um, basis, for example, regulatory bodies as to uh, how to move forward with uh, with incentives, with scheme, with schemes. Um, we do this kind of um, strategy and, and operational support in terms of, let's say, um, strategy consultancy for our clients. So the way that we do this, uh, we have a cool diagram to try and explain this. John is going to walk us through that. So, John, if you could just uh, walk us through this slide, um, that would be great. Over to you, John. Yeah, great. Thank you, Victor. Um, so I think that was a good introduction to what we do at Aurora, but diving in a little bit deeper into the different sectors within the company and how we actually achieve all of this intelligence and then provide it to our clients. Um, so what you're looking at at the moment um, is kind of a mixture between a pie chart and a um, donut. Uh, but the uh, the idea here is to actually show that um, all of our analysis um, and our commission project teams and our research and even the SAS team is centered around the model. Um, and so we have a very talented team of modelers at Aurora who um, uh, model currently uh, Western Europe um, as well as Australia, the power markets there. Um, they also perform analysis modeling on the commodity markets and um, as Victor explained, we um, we are including hydrogen as well at the moment, and so um, this provides the kind of central building blocks for um, analysis which Aurora conducts, um, and we provide uh, services to our clients in three main ways: um, through the uh, research and publications team, uh, through the commission projects team, and through the SAS team. Um, and so I'll start with the research and publications team. Um, here we take um, a more long-term uh, view of uh, markets which we model um, and a more general view of the markets which we model and um, the aim is to provide an industry standard market outlook um, providing quarterly reports um, explaining the uh, outputs of our models in different scenarios um, whether these are um, optimistic scenarios or pessimistic scenarios um, or potentially investigating um, new policy updates which could be happening in a particular country or market. Um, and these go out to over 300 subscribers um, and are read and constantly challenged um, by our subscribers. Uh, we in fact actually invite um, people who subscribe to our research and publications um, to come and encourage this challengement and um, we have roundtables where they are given the opportunity to ask questions. And because of this, um, we're constantly kept on our toes and um, are very used to defending our research. And this is quite a unique point with Aurora, which we're quite proud of our engagement. Um, so moving on from that, uh, we have our commission projects uh, team and um, this team provides bespo uh, bespoke analysis using the modeling, uh, using the model. Um, so again, supported by the modeling team and um, the models which we've developed over the past four or five years. Um, and here these help uh, support transactions um, or valuations, as well as providing um, unique uh, independent thoughts on strategy or potentially um, doing the same for policy. Um, and then finally, we have the uh, software as a service side of the company. And this is the um, newest part of the company. Uh, which is quite exciting work um, where we are uh, aiming to um, automate or provide the services um, which the commission projects team and research and publication teams do, but in a way where clients can interact with them using a variety of tools and interact with the model directly using a variety of tools. And so an example of this is um, the Amun, which we created recently, which allows users to um, create a wind farm and dispatch it against our model prices and calculate um, an array of financial uh, parameters to see, uh, I guess, how valuable a wind farm would be. Um, and I think that is a quick introduction, unless Victor has anything else to add to the slide. 
thank you very much, John. No, I think uh, I think that very much sums up very well the uh, uh, how we work in Aurora and very much like you said, how is it that we deliver the value to our clients, which we are uh, aiming to provide. But I think one thing that's very interesting here uh, is that uh, depending on the interest of any person, uh, of any uh, person that wants to go into the energy industry, I think this serves quite a wide menu into uh, the, the opportunities that people have into joining different areas. So are you really passionate about, for example, uh, economic theory, modeling, uh, and that sort of thing? Then, the, uh, like John said, we have a very talented um, group of modelers who model uh, who model these uh, these markets, maintain it, expand them, add new capabilities constantly. As our CEO likes to put it out, sometimes uh, you sh the, the modelers are kind of like the rock stars within the company. Um, those are uh, that's actually the word that he uses, but it's very true because, like you see, every single thing that we deliver is based on the models and the data that that we have. So that is our core within Aurora. So um, if you like uh, dealing with clients, if you like uh, jumping on a different problem and jumping into a project and seeing how you can solve that, then the commission project is really good for you. If you like to really specialize into something, for example, the Iberian market or, you, uh, or the Polish market, um, or you have, uh, or even flexibility about batteries, uh, batteries and energy storage, then there's different topics within research and publications that you can really dedicate yourself to um, and bring out the content that we provide in the subscriptions. And well, software as a service is, is a world on its own. It's a, I like to describe it as a bit of an entrepreneurial kind of site where you get to do a bit of everything, design the product, tailor it to the client's need, develop it, and then, well, use it and sell it. So um, depending on whatever you like, uh, we have a wide range of, of areas in which you could uh, you could come in. So uh, hopefully I, I think there's a bit of something interesting for everybody. So if we uh, like we said, we have been working uh, for uh, I think the company was founded in 2006. So that means that um, or, uh, or even 16, actually, I, I, don't, I don't quite know if, if someone knows, please, uh, please jump in and, and correct me. But we're quite a young company. And uh, even though we're quite a young company, as you can see on the screen, we have worked with quite a lot of clients. Uh, we're very proud um, of the influence that we have gained uh, over the years, uh, not only here, but also in our different offices. Uh, we're we're going to show you where we have offices um, uh, in a few slides, but you can see quite a lot of quite a lot of names um, in this chart, but not only the amount of names that we have, but also, as you can see, we're tapping into different sectors. Um, we're doing power and utilities, policy and regulation, financial sector and investors, and oil and gas. So we're widespread across the industry, and that allows us to have that unique perspective that John was, that John was talking about. So this has been something really interesting to get to interact with uh, mar big market players across all the different sectors uh, of the energy industry. So one very interesting uh, project, this is a case study that, that we want to uh, very quickly talk to you about. One case study that we have been talking about or that we did recent, recently is uh, a study on hydrogen. So we basically studied the role of hydrogen in a net zero GB. There is a public version of the report um, which you can download uh, from our website. So uh, if you're interested in that, I would really recommend uh, go over to a website, download the report. It's really, really interesting. Um, and the public report was basically a part of a wider project in which we had 15 different clients. Some of them uh, are being shown on the screen. Some of the clients uh, decided to stay private um, uh, and not publicize that they were uh, supporting the uh, the um, the project, but in total we had 15. It was quite a long project. It was around seven months, and um, we uh, if if we're in the energy industry, you probably heard that hydrogen is a very hot topic out there at the moment. I can even see that we have a question about where will the uh, aviation sector fall? How is the aviation sector going to uh, sector going to decarbonize? Well, the aviation sector has a very unique challenge, and hydrogen is one of those solutions that could come in. Um, to allow the industry to decarbonize. Um, at the end of the day, uh, aviation is still one of the most uncertain ones. Um, a clear solution or a, at least a clear winner in terms of bringing the decarbonization for the industry has yet to emerge. But we know that um, hydrogen might be one of those solutions, but it would probably be a combination between that and abatement. 
that's just one of the things that we saw in um, in the in the study. We uh, we saw what the effect of hydrogen would be on the economics of existing and new power market uh, power assets like wind farms and, and solar farms, um, even for storage assets like uh, large batteries or pumped hydro. Uh, we we mapped what were the policy implications of hydrogen in the GB energy system. It was quite a quite a big uh, a broad study, quite interesting, and it has gained quite a lot of influence. And this is for one of the projects that, for example, if you come into Aurora, you might get the chance to work into one of these interesting projects, which is why we're showing to you uh, showing them to you here. Uh, there's a, uh, another uh, study that we did. This second one was on the um, was on the research and publication side. The first one was on the commission projects one. This one is for what we call RP, and we studied what was the um, what was the effect of COVID and uh, what should a green uh, recovery look like. And if you see on the on the right, we um, we not only studied the impact that COVID has had on the uh, on the energy sector and the impact that we expected to have in the short, uh, short, medium, and long term, but we also looked at, for example, different policy measures that the uh, that the government can uh, government can enact. And across those different um, those different policy measures, which you can see how we evaluate them in the spider charts on on the right, um, you can see the fact that we didn't just look at the power price we didn't just look at value of assets we didn't just look like um, the impact in society we basically um looked at a wide range of um of solutions we looked at a wide range of indicators to get like i said a holistic view of the energy sector so that we can bring a uh, a very complete solution to a problem that like we've said before doesn't only rely on the technical or the economical it touches almost every aspect in human society. So we brought in uh, our strength, our analysis, our forecasts, um, and the expertise of our people into trying to bring intelligence into uh, how what is the best way forward into getting out of COVID, which we know has had a major impact worldwide um, and, and has basically touched every single uh, aspect of our lives um, as we have all experienced over the last months. Uh, there is a really cool third uh, case study. I'll bring John in again to talk to us about uh, a bit about Amun. He has worked directly with us, so I think John, uh, you can offer us a very good perspective on this uh, case study. Um, yeah, thanks, Victor. So uh, we've mentioned the Amun tool a few times, um, and just repeat what it actually is. It's part of the software as a service team, and was the first piece of software we developed. Um, the team was first created about a year ago. Um, with a uh, uh, conception that this would be our first project. And the idea of it is it, um, it's a tool that allows you to evaluate the business cases for wind farms. Um, and the idea here is that it could be used by both developers of wind farms and um, asset operator and owners in uh, supporting transactions um, if you're buying and selling them. Um, and so the SaaS team, um, kind of as Victor, uh, very eloquently put, um, it's a little bit like a, a startup within Aurora. We take um, conception of an, a project, and we vet uh, the ideas and have this kind of brainstorming session to figure out what it could look like and um, explore different routes, um, and then develop the tool, um, and then we try to sell the tool as um, a service um, to clients. Uh, and so we're very proud of which is now being used um, across multiple different countries um, by a wide range of um, different use cases. Um, and some of the things which I've kind of been involved with here and I've really enjoyed is um, given the opportunity to uh, make a real impact and kind of own individual parts of this tool. So, for example, I was able to um, be put in charge of the expansion um, of Amun to different countries. And this involved um, interacting with lots of different parts of Aurora, both um, the model side and um, interacting and understanding with um, how the forecasts are actually uh, created, as well as also kind of owning my own niche and expertise with the country I'm expanding to. Um, it's kind of sits as a unique part with Aurora because this is where we really see a lot of the energy industry and the work which we do um, transitioning towards. 
um, allowing our uh, subscribers and customers to interact directly with our model, which provides the core kind of um, analysis and support for the country. Uh, for the company, sorry, as Victor said, there are our rock stars, the modelers, and so um, uh, the kind of long-term um, ambition with this all would be to uh, effectively um, create these different services um, and allowing kind of uh, the work which we do in commissions project and RP to be streamlined um, and really would place Aurora in quite a unique position in the industry as a example a moon was the first tool of its kind to be created and um, it's very exciting to be involved with kind of a company with this much innovation going on um i'm sorry john not not, not sure if uh we cannot hear you or uh is, is uh, anything working on? i yes. think um it said just kind of i finished there with um a couple of words but that's pretty much everything i want to say all right. Yes, perfect. And uh, well, as you can see, quite a lot of interesting projects. Um, Amun, like uh, John just said, first tool of its kind to be uh, to be developed. And like uh, like we mentioned before, you see it from beginning to end. What is what is the client need uh, that we can fulfill with the, with the capacities that we have? How can we do it? How can we perfect it? And once we have it, how can we expand it? Find new uses for it. So it's um, like 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 John said, it's a bit of a startup you get to see a bit of everything. So it's very exciting. Um, and there's a lot of places to go depending on what your um, expertise is. And one of the things that we also like to showcase is that, well, our main audience during this webinar is the students from the Oxford Energy Society. So um, that not only covers a lot of disciplines, but it also covers a lot of regions. Um, Oxford is a highly international um, university. And uh, very much like we're rooting at Oxford, uh, Aurora is also a very international uh, place to be. Um, on the screen, we have uh, the testimonials from uh, some of the people in Aurora, uh, including myself. And uh, if if I'm correct, I think Nick's German, Carmen's from Malaysia, me, myself, I'm from Panama, Ayub is from Lebanon, and then Becca is British. So as you can see, um, you're going to be interacting with people from all over the world uh, with different expertises, with different points of view. And it's ca that kind of multicultural environment that you would like um, that people like to be involved in. I personally like it a lot. I think it adds a lot of value. And uh, you can see for yourself some of the testimonials that, that we have shared. Uh, in my case, for example, we, we saw the hydrogen project and I was involved in that project from day uh, from 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 the very beginning of the project. And I had only been in Aurora for three months. So three months, and I was already being able to get involved involved in one of the most exciting projects that the company has had, uh, going into a very interesting topic that is in everyone's mouths in the energy industry at the moment. And I was only three months in. So that is the kind of opportunity that I think brings a lot of value to Aurora and that we want to showcase um, for you, which I think is uh, it's it, it would be very interesting for you as well. And one thing that can also be very interesting for you is to say, well, if I go into the company, what kind of capacities will I, will I develop? Uh, what kind of things am I going to learn? And uh, we, we've been developing a, um, an exhaustive training program so you can develop the skills that not only that you need, but also the, the skills that you, want that, uh, that you want to have as a professional moving forward in your career in your career. So for example, we have the onboarding program where you learn about um, power markets and commodity markets, um, where you learn about um, the renewables, the markets, the flexible markets, which are a very tricky one. This is about um, uh, energy storage and gas peakers, for example. So that kind of generation that comes in when demand is very high and we need to meet it, uh, usually with thermal generation, uh, that is flexible. Uh, the flexible ones. Moving on, uh, we also have a general program for people within the company discovers Python. Python is very widely used within the, uh, within the company. Power BI, um, client communication skills, um, basic uh, stakeholder management, project management. Um, as you can see, it's not just about the technical capacities. It's also about um, you developing exhaustively as a professional with a wider set of skills. And then we also have a junior management program uh, in which actually myself just started. Well, um, you learn more about um, uh, a wider uh, set of skills so you can be a manager yourself. And for example, you learn about 
Agile and Scrum, you learn about um, uh, media training, you learn about uh, the role of a manager, uh, advanced stakeholder management, which uh, let me tell you, when you're working in the energy industry and with different sectors can be quite tricky. Um, so we have developed an exhaustive um, training program so that we know that um, that you'll be developing that potential uh, while working with us within the company. And it offers a lot of opportunities. Um, it's very funny because this slide has changed a lot since I first saw it when I joined uh, a year ago. So um, like I said, we're, we're a young company, but we have grown very fast. At the moment, we have over 135 people within the company. As John mentioned, we have over 300 subscribers um, that uh, uh, continuously go through our research and publications material. We uh, supported over 75 transactions in 2019. And we have currently three offices. Uh, the first one and the main one in Oxford. We, we're also in Berlin and Sydney. It's not uncommon to see opportunities where you can uh, you can go to another um, um, to another office in another country. Uh, usually, around uh, it's uh, this is something that that people really really like to do, and there's naturally a lot of competition into seeing uh, who will get the spot to go for a year to Australia or go to uh, for a year into Germany. But that is a very very um, exciting opportunity to have to move around in, in in the company. And so very recently, we have started uh, modeling markets also in the United States. It is also probable. Uh, don't take it from me. Though it's not right, written in stone, but it's also likely that we will have um, offices in the United States in the near future. Uh, let's hope for that. But as you can see, it's a fast growing company. And I think this is one of the main things that differentiate Aurora from the rest of the companies. Usually when you go to a, a, a bigger organization, there's 20 very qualified people already waiting in line uh, for one position to open for one, um, or to escalate within the company. In our case, we are expanding quickly. Opportunities are out there. If you prove your worth, there will most likely be soon an opportunity for uh, for you to come in. And as we saw in the testimonials, one of the things that we've been doing during the pandemic is recruiting. We have been recruiting actively, um, which not only shows the resilience of the industry and the company, but it also shows the fact that we're expanding quickly. And like I said, opportunities will be out there. So as a third point, um, I'd like to quickly walk through you uh, the main thing that we would like to, um, to to talk to you about right now, which is how you can join and how you can how you can join your our, our team and what what opportunities are out there. So um, we have, like any company, we have a rolling recruitment process in which we post our different um, our different opportunities and to which positions are available. You can see that in the link uh, below on the left-hand side, which is uh, auroraer.com slash careers at Aurora. So you, um, so you can see the opportunities that we have there in the, all, all the areas that we have within the company. And this expansion that I'm talking about is happening across the company. It's not just one area of the company that's growing fast. It's all of it. So if you're interested into these opportunities, please go in, but specifically, um, if you're just coming out, um, if you're just coming out of uh, of university, you just uh, you just finished university, then uh, probably the the best opportunity for you would be the graduate program. We understand that um, the academic year you started, so we wouldn't expect you to come in uh, and work with us in in the next month or two. So the graduate program that we have open right now, whose deadline will close on the eighth of November, mark this date, this date, eighth of November. Um, we'll be closing the applications for the graduate program for the people who will be coming in in autumn in the following year. So if you want to secure a, a nice job uh, from very early on um, and you want to secure a spot with us and you think uh, that you're interested in what we have to offer and, and that we would be interested to having you in, your, in our team, please go in um, in the link that you can see on the lower part on the right hand side. Um, you'll find everything about our graduate program, how to join. And uh, remember, applications will be closing on the 8th of November. So if you're interested, please go in. Um, Stephanie will will offer us in the end some of the experience that she's had so far in the program. Like we, like we said, Stephanie is one of the people who joined um, the, the company through the first uh, uh, version of the graduate program that we did. Um, and it includes rotating within different um, rotating between different uh, departments. So you get to see a bit of everything. And at the end of the program, you will be offered a, uh, a permanent position. 
So that means that during the graduate program, you will be going around to the uh, through different departments, learning everything. But at the end, you will be offered a a permanent position. So this is a very good opportunity to secure a job long term um, here in the UK. Um, in, in, in a company that's growing fast, that gives you a lot of opportunities. So if you're interested, then again, please visit our website. So if we uh, look at the specifics of the programs, you'll be doing three placements uh, in, different, in different teams across 20 months. You will have an ac accelerated training into how energy markets work. You will be involved directly in client projects. You will not be in a back office just doing the, the paperwork or anything like that. You will be directly involved in these projects. Um, just ask Stephanie, I, I think she, she'll she have a, a good testimony to give on that. And you'll have a, uh, an opportunity to get a taste of the real experience within Aurora. So um, like I said, it's not just uh, a back office kind of job, you will get the real experience if you join the program. And in terms of what we'll be looking for um, in a candidate, um, so like, I said, like, like we said, if, if you're interested, if you think that what Aurora has to offer is really good, then please, um, uh, please send your application, but pay attention to the requirements that we're looking for in our candidates, uh, not, only, uh, not only in terms of, uh, let's say, ticking all the boxes, but also try to emphasize on these strengths uh, when you submit your cover letter, when you submit your CV, uh, make sure that you emphasize on these strengths so that we will take good notice of you. Um, some of the things that we're looking for is a first class or high second class degree from a leading university. We know that Oxford University is naturally on that top. So uh, you're already probably taking that box already. Uh, you, you must be available to join Aurora in the next autumn. Uh, so uh, it, it is a bit long-term, but we, uh, we do need you to be available to come in uh, when the next, basically when the next, uh, or this current academic year ends. Um, and in terms of the quality uh, of what, you, what we need you to be able to do and like to do is um, be able to collect, analyze, and interpret co complex in information. Like we said, a holistic view of the powers of the power sector is what we do. So we need people who can take a lot of information, analyze it, and convey it uh, efficiently to to our clients. You need to have a strong quantitative uh, set of skills. There is a lot of uh, of numbers involved into this. There's a lot of modeling. Um, there's a lot of calculation involved in this. So that's one of the things that we'll be looking for. You uh, you need to have some evidence into working effectively in teams. Um, we work in teams all the time. All our departments interact very closely and within the departments we interact closely. So uh, working as a team is a very important uh, skill to have. And uh, if you have fluency in a, in a second European language, that would be good. It's not essential, but it is highly valued. So uh, you can also take a look into the different markets that we work on, for example, uh, Germany, the Netherlands, um, Spain. So if you have, um, uh, uh, if you know any languages that, that are spoken into those regions, then that would be uh, something of a plus that can get you uh, a bit of, a, of an advantage. And last but not least, we would like to open the floor, first of all, for a discussion, any, uh, any topics that we think that, um, that would be good to bring in, into the discussion at the moment would be very good. And also any questions that we pick up from, from the audience. Uh, as a first step, I would say um, if um, Steph, um, John, and Emma, please, if you could come in, uh, give a quick um, overview as to what's your experience been in Aurora so far, uh, what do you think of the company, and any message that you would like to give to people who are thinking about joining our team, uh, please do so. Uh, could we choose the first victim? Could I, uh, could I go with uh, Steph first? Yeah, of course. Thank you, Victor. Um, so like Victor said, I'm part of the graduate program and I started about three and a half months ago now. And I'm already taking an active role in the company. So I'm currently on the CP team. I, after a couple of weeks of starting, I was already working on my first project. Just this week, I did my first client call interaction where I actually presented my results. So as Victor said, you're definitely not just in the back getting people coffee you're actually taking an active role and it's really interesting work nice good good thank you thank you stephanie uh john what do you think uh you, you've been in the company for for a bit longer but uh what's your perspective um yeah so i've been in the company for about close to a year now uh, about 10 months um i think uh, the big thing which has really stood out for the company particularly through these like trying times is 
people who you work side by side with as well. Um, it's a young company and a young team. And um, because of that, uh, you end up making these really nice kind of like relationships within um, company across teams, um, which makes it a really nice place to work. Um, and even through uh, lockdown, um, that kind of camaraderie and positivity still being able to shine through. Um, which I think I've, I've really valued being at Aurora. And the other thing, which um, kind of almost is a given, I think anywhere at Aurora is the fact that you make a direct impact kind of from day one. Um, as Steph mentioned, she was working on a project and just done her her first kind of client call. Um, she went straight off the back. Um, I was immediately chucked into expanding this tool to different countries. And then most recently have um, started um, exploring the idea of creating our next uh, big adventure in SaaS, um, which could be a solo tool. Um, and so having these opportunities, it, I guess it's systemic from the company being quite young and growing very quickly, but it's something which I highly value. Yes, yes, for sure. Uh, I had the same experience during the hydrogen project, only being three months in. My first project was a solo project for the Scottish Crown Estate. Um, was a bit intimidating, but that's the kind of opportunities that you want to have. Uh, so it's definitely, yeah, I think it's like you said, it's sometimes we take it as a given, but having the opportunity to have that impact is also a big, a big plus in the company. Um, how about you, Emma? You've been uh, with us for a couple uh, couple months now. Uh, what do you think? It's just for a month, actually. Yeah. Which means I guess the one experience that I've had um, that maybe the rest of you missed out on was the whole interviewing through lockdown process. I think I'm probably the only person on the call that's never been to the office. Uh, and never actually met anyone in the company in person. Um, so I was obviously quite nervous about this, both in the interviews uh, and in terms of joining a team um, who I knew I was never going to meet or wasn't going to meet for months. Hopefully it will happen at some point. Um, but I will say that I thought Aurora handled its interviewing process uh, in lockdown really, really well. And I had interviewed at other companies um, in that time period too. Uh, and the thing that made a difference with Aurora, I think that they recognised how uh different the procedure actually was so then you know i had a lot of interviews i had hours of interviews more than i would have otherwise expected um, but what that really gave me was the opportunity to talk to the people who are now my teammates uh, and really kind of get a feel for what the company was like uh, which is obviously much harder if you're only doing things on teams um, so that was one aspect uh, of the kind of remote interviewing process which i think if you apply through the graduate uh, program i don't know how they're planning on doing it yet possibly hr don't either uh, but you might face um, and everyone was really friendly uh, even at that point and, and really open to taking extra questions and, and taking the time to get to know you um, and that's kind of a, a thing that i found even after i've joined the company everyone in my team has reached out to me and we've had virtual coffee uh, and things and it's been a really welcoming environment to come into um, and yeah, and, and like Steph and, and John and Victor have said, it, you know, I've been here a month now and I started my third project today. Um, so you really are getting stuck in uh, right at the deep end, um, straight in there with dealing with clients and, and exciting projects and things. Um, so it's been a fantastic experience oh, for that, me. That's, so that's perfect. Thank you very much, Emma. I'm glad to hear that uh, they found us to be so uh, so friendly. <laughs> Thank you very much. I wasn't involved in the, into any other process, but it's good to know uh, that the company made you feel good, that, that we have made you feel welcome, uh, and that you're liking the experience so far. So uh, so people, there you have it. Those are uh, first-hand testimonials for, from people inside the company. Uh, just so you know, we're not getting paid to be in this, in this presentation. Uh, we're not getting any kind of additional benefit for being in the presentation. So uh, these are our honest views about the company. We really wanna, like Emma said, get you to get a real feel into what the company is like, uh, get to know what could be your teammates uh, a year from now, get to know how people inside the, the company, how they feel, how they relate. So um, so we really hope that we're bringing you some, some value into this. Um, at this point, I think we can take uh, a few of the questions that I'm looking at um, in the comments. So um, one of the questions say, uh, says, if uh, graduates get to choose the sector pro or project in, the, in which they want to focus on during the graduate program, um, this, will, this, will be, um, uh, this will be mainly based on, oh, I see the question come up, came up on the screen, that's, that's useful. Um, so um, this will mainly depend on the availability of projects. So, for example, um, if you're in the while you're in the commission projects team, 
uh, one of the things that you can do is tell people, and we actually encourage people to do this quite a lot, is if you see an up upcoming project that you would be very interested in working on, um, then uh, let us know. And we, when planning out the resources on who's going to work in which project, then we can say, hey, you know, um, Evan, Evan wants to work on this flexible asset project, or Evan wants to work in the next hydrogen project. Hey, uh, we know that's uh, something that 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 he wants to do. Then, if resources allow, then uh, you will most likely be placed in, in one of those projects. I think within the research and publications team, uh, it, it can probably be uh, be done as well. Naturally, this will depend on the availability of people to work on the projects, but we're very open into uh, assigning people to the things that they're interested. On. So it's definitely a possibility. Um, there is also another question on if people from another country uh, can apply to the program or, um, well, uh, you can, you can. There are uh, some considerations. I'm not really sure on, on the small print, but I do know that we can, uh, that we can have, um, that we can have students from, from other countries. Uh, I myself am from Panama and I'm being sponsored, uh, my working visa is being sponsored by Aurora, so we can sponsor students from other countries, so long as they meet the requirements. Um, th there might be some special considerations, some paperwork that may need to be done, but um, I am fairly sure that we can take applicants from uh, from different places uh, and from different countries, not necessarily just from the UK. So uh, if you take all the boxes and the requirements that we said, then most likely you are a worthy candidate to come in and to, um, to come into the program. Um, I see there's also a question from Jessica and it says, how does the training program work? Is it computer-based training or mentorship? Also, why are Aurora's primary clients and um, who are Aurora primary clients and why do clients choose Aurora over other consulting companies? So for the first question, um, how the training will happen, well, it, it is a bit of everything. Um, we do have a mentorship program um, in which you'll, you'll be assigned a mentor. This is not necessarily during the graduate program, but it is within the wider um, development program that we showed um, later on on the slides. So part of that is having a mentor um, that will uh, listen to you, uh, see what the, the, the requirements that you have, any difficulties, difficulties that you have, Anything in particular that you would like to develop, that uh, mentor will help you in the journey into uh, into doing that. But you will also learn a lot um, from hands-on training. So doing things, learning by doing, is one of the things, one of the main ways that you will learn. But you can also leverage on the expertise of the people around you, and you would be surprised not only how willing people are to share their knowledge, but on the amount of expertise that you can tap into. Um, and it's usually one team's message away. It used to be. Just go stand, uh, go to someone's desk and ask them. But well, that's not possible at the moment. Um, but but yeah, it is a bit of everything. It's a bit of training. It's a bit of uh, mentorship, and it's a lot of um, uh, learning by doing. So uh, so that's kind of like the philosophy that we have. And in terms of why our clients choose us, um, well, in the the way that we have seen it, one of the main competitive advantages of the company is that we provide independent, unbiased analysis. So one of the things that we get from our clients a lot is first of all that uh, we're not biased towards any specific solution, any specific, any specific uh, political stance, um, or any specific pathway for decarbonization, technology, nothing. We provide a non-biased um, view of the power sector, and that um, and that reliability gives us a lot of value among the clients. This is something that's come up a lot. And I think the second thing is what John was mentioning, the fact that uh, we have a research and publications team which is constantly looking um, into uh, into the topics, and then we bring that research and publications expertise into our commission projects. Um, so if w once we have already dominated completely, we understand very, very well, for example, the Iberian market or the UK power market or the German market, then um, which we do in a continuous process in which we interact with our clients, our claims get challenged, uh, we refine our assumptions, we refine our analysis, and then a client comes to us with a question, then we are in a very good position to answer that question really well. So that perfectioning kind of uh, cycle that we have from the interaction between um, the different parts of the company is what brings a lot of value into the analysis that we do. I think actually um, one of the things add there, uh, Victor, as well, is the um, fact that we do our modeling in-house. It's something which yeah. also differentiates, differentiates us massively from our competitors. 
Um, this allows us kind of to have complete control over the assumptions the model can make. Uh, we invest very heavily in developing this expertise and this model, um, and our clients really value that investment we've made and that insight we can get from it. Yeah, yeah, that's that's definitely it. Um, in other companies, you would see or you will usually hear that the modeling is not in-house. Uh, and the model is usually a black, black box for most people. If something needs to change within the model, it's usually not easy to do. We can tailor our analysis and we can tailor the model to any specific need that we are, or our clients have. So that gives us a lot of flexibility um, into providing this value, which very much John for bringing that up. It's one of the main uh, things that we uh, that we do. Um, a lot of questions focus on the graduate program. It says if those people graduating in November 2021 can apply. Um, I will say actually that is our main um, that is our main focus um, at the moment. So people who who are currently in the academic year that's uh, that uh, that started not too long ago and who will be graduating um, around that time next year. Those are our main audience. So like we said. Um, it's very early on, so it's a good opportunity to secure a, um, a place very early on in the company. So if you're within that group, uh, feel free to apply. That is uh, that is within the, the time that we're expecting you to become available after you finish the program. So that would be um, so that would be that would be what we're doing. Before I forget, um, we're going to have a series of events, not only with the Oxford Energy Society, but also um, aside. Uh, keep an eye out for other events with the Oxford Energy Society. We have not planned these yet, but we really want to, uh, to have them. Uh, so keep an eye out for the mailing list and our social media. You can follow us on social media at Aurora ER underscore Oxford. Um, you can follow us on social media. If you want to go into um, the graduate program, we have the link uh, on the screen at the moment. Is auroraer.com slash graduate program. You'll find all the information there. You can also join our mailing list so that um, you get uh, you stay up to date with any um, any developments that we have, any opportunities, or even the podcast. We have a podcast on on Spotify. Um, we usually bring uh, very influential people. The late, latest one was from the C with the CEO of EDF. So there, those are very interesting podcasts. So if you're interested in that, go check that out as well. And any general careers um, careers information that you might want to have, uh, you'll find it on auroraer.com slash careers at Aurora. This not only includes our graduate program, but all the, all the opportunities that we have on a rolling basis. And um, I'll take one last question, which says, how many interviews should one expect through the application process? Um, I'm not entirely sure, but I think there are two, there's two rounds of applications. It might be three. I, I don't think there is. I think there's two rounds of applications. That is after we have filtered um, the first round of applicants. Uh, we have looked at the CVs and selected the ones with the most potential. I think there's two stages of interviews. And after that, then we will announce um, the selections of the candidates. So um, um, unless there's any additional questions or any message that uh, Steph, John, and Emma would like to offer, uh, I would give it over um, to the Energy Society in case you want to please uh, make any closing remarks. Hello, thank you very much, Victor and the team for a very informative session. So um, I know we're running over the time a little bit, but it'd be nice if you could just give a little um, answer to the question that I mentioned a few times about emerging markets, um, first of all, China, Brazil, India, and then also studies in new markets beside Europe. Oh, well, that is um, that is a very interesting question. Um, I myself come from a country which is uh, which is um, uh, facing a very uh, a very similar um, a very similar issue. Uh, and that is a very complex question to answer. Uh, let's say, for example, China. Uh, China announced recently that it wants to become net zero. I think it is by 2060. And it is hard to grasp the um the size of of that statement it is a very strong statement to make not only because china has relied a lot on coal generation but also on the fact that it is such a huge market and not only the amount of demand that it already has but also like uh uh like like it's being pointed out the the populate population growth in the country so um it's not going to be easy and it's a very it's a question that has many different aspects to it so i think the best reference for it would be uh, the slide where we have the different um the, the different stages of what needs to happen 
uh, well, these countries would probably need to tap into um, into all of these solutions. Um, the first one uh, probably being energy efficiency, and not only energy efficiency in terms of um, in terms of uh, the technology, but the behavior. So the behavior of the demand, um, how much energy we use, how we use it, and when we use it, will be uh, will be a very important part of the part of the answer. Um, the second part would probably be the the supply. This doesn't necessarily mean just uh, wind and solar. Uh, it will require quite a, quite a lot of um, development of or deployment of renewable energy or low carbon generation. But also um, in terms of reliability of the supply, you will also need some thermal. So that's when uh, carbon capture and sequestration can help you make your supply bigger, but also reliable and low carbon. So those are some of the solutions to look at. Now, uh, like we said, if you have a lot of renewables, you will need a lot of grid investments, not only transmission and distribution, but also storage. So um, uh, that's going to require quite a lot of investment. It's going to be a challenge, but it can be done. And um, very much like the other elements that we have uh, mentioned, uh, the country has or, or these countries have the advantage that these technologies have already been widely deployed in other countries. They're proven technologies that have reduced costs significantly, significantly over the last years. Uh, so there's a lot of expertise um, and a lot of e economies of scale that these countries can tap into. And um, naturally, well, you have the, the fact that, that uh, some solutions will be harder to, um, to decarbonize. So that's when um, using electricity for applications that we're not using them for recently, for example, um, heating, we tend to use gas. That's one thing that can be electrified or hydrogen, which can come in into transport, aviation, um, heating and even industry applications, hydrogen can come in and complement that uh, that last part of the solution that we need. But this naturally is a very wide question, but this gives a glimpse into some of the solutions that these countries can look into. Great. Thank you so much for a very informative session. Thank you again for joining us and thank you everyone for listening to us today. So please stay tuned for next week. Next week on Wednesday, we still have so what do we need to do for the net zero future? Um, that happens on Wednesday at 5.30. So please tune in if you can, and we look forward to seeing you next time. Thank you again, and thank right. you to our team. All right, thank you very much. See you again soon. See ya. Thank you.